Push on the Underground Railroad metaphor just for a second. So um, uh, it's one Quakers love to reference. And, uh, <laughs> and so I'm thinking about, so there's a group, a uh, new sanctuary movement here in Philadelphia. And, um, and they, uh, they are specifically working with undocumented uh, immigrants. Uh, who are increasingly one of the major areas of mass incarceration, so the growth rate as more and more people are getting detained and then thrown out of the country. And so um, one of the things that they have begun doing is creating out of their namesake of sanctuary, providing sanctuary to immigrants, undocumented immigrants, who are threatened with being final uh, exporting orders, so giving their final deportation orders. So in Philadelphia this has happened and they were able to uh, get through public pressure um, a woman who was held for I think three months might have been the period of time, uh, held three months in a church um, and were able to get her final deportation order revoked. That's a different model than the charity model of the Underground Railroad. And the way you just sort of describe the Underground Railroad sort of linked it closely to, to charity, I just want us to tease out, which is the Underground Railroad wasn't just survival, it was survival with sacrifice. Right, right. And uh, where is the sacrifice? Where are the places, where are the folks who you see modeling, doing that charity in a way that's sacrificial versus simply beneficial to myself? And if I could um, segue on to that, we have to look back at history and realize that the Underground Railroad was not just a vehicle for slaves to come to the North. Once they came to the North, they had to create a new life. Right. They had to build a infrastructure to move forward into the future. Right. So we look at mass incarceration, once a person comes out of that system, they have to build an infrastructure. Right. And this is where organizations, churches, activists who are serious about mass incarceration can focus. It's on the community level. Mm -hmm. What happens to a person who's done 10, 15 years when they come out? Mm -hmm. What has been happening to the children of incarcerated parents, which we really don't talk about? Right. This is a side of mass incarceration that really has to have more focus. Mm -hmm. When I was incarcerated, I had a wonderful family who stepped in and basically raised my kids for 18 years while I was incarcerated. What about the families that don't have that? What about the kids who are in DHS? We have children in our after school drop-in program whose father is doing life in prison. That is a daunting challenge for a 10-year-old boy who will never walk with his father under a tree or have the normal relations that we take for granted for the rest of his life. What do you put in a place so that he can visit his father, build a relationship, and have that sort of male companionship and family arrangement that will turn him into a person who can exist in society in a positive manner and not be so hardened and cold to the system that he's one of the kids out there burning down buildings simply because he feels there's no hope and his whole life has to be threatened. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, I think one of the most important challenges we face is in treating the folks who have been labeled the felons or the criminals or even the children who are dealing with folks who are, with loved ones who are behind um, bars is asking ourselves, what is the level of care, compassion, and concern that folks deserve and that we can model? It's one thing to say, the system shouldn't be so punitive. The system should show care and concern. It's another question to say, what does it mean for me to show care and concern? What does it mean for my community to show care and concern? What does it mean for my faith group to show care and concern? And to be very concrete about what that looks like in terms of funding, in terms of volunteer support, in terms of the time that's spent, that's in terms of what is said publicly, what 
all of that, I think, is a very different kind of conversation. It moves us away from just anal analyzing the problem to being very specific about what does it mean for me individually and our group collectively to do what we think our government ought to be doing. Um, if we believe our government should be acting with more care and concern, how does it look for us to demonstrate that in the lives of individuals? And there's countless ways um, that we can do it. And I think one of the great things about Daniel's book is that he identifies the fact that there is no one role for people to play, that mm -hmm. everyone is going to have different skills, talents, abilities, um, passions that they can bring to the movement. It's about figuring out what is the unique contribution that you individually or your group or organization can make to this. There's going to be a role for artists. There's going to be a role for healthcare workers. There's going to be a role for people who are psychologists and who can provide mental so health support. There's going to be a role for all of us in figuring out um, what can we do concretely. Um, you know, I think for me, as someone who is a writer, I'm constantly challenging myself, all right, how can my writing be of use? How can it serve the movement? And uh, we all have something to contribute. Um, and very often, I think it's easy for us to sit back and go, well, what can I do? Um, rather than being really honest about the skills, interests, capacities that we have and that there are opportunities right in our own local communities to apply them in a way that will be meaningful and valuable.